Okay. Thank you. Uh, I've been talking inaudibly about John Reps here. His uh, credentials for many of us are highest in the field of urban history. Uh, he gave a lecture this afternoon in which many of us realized exactly how much we owe to him and that much of what we pass on to students in the way of urban history is in fact derived from one or more of his books. It's been a very uh, seminal inspiration in this field. He's also the publisher and proprietor of Historic Urban Plans, which has made available uh, some of the uh, reproductions of the historic old urban plans. He's been the author of over 50 articles, five books, including one that will be forthcoming, a monumental work on the cities of the American West. He's going to speak to us tonight about the uh, interesting tradition of town plans or town views during the uh, 19th century. The title of his lecture is Cities on Stone. John Reps. I'm glad to be back after my long uh, time away from this room. <laughs> A few hours. If I can get this microphone on, I'll begin this lecture. But, uh, I'm evidently doing something wrong. Trying to get it in there, right? Okay. Well, uh, Revolutions often start with small events, and the radical change in the world of printmaking that began in the waning years of the 18th century had just such a modest origin. A young Bavarian named Alois Senefelder had been experimenting with making etchings from an incised stone rather than from a copper plate. One day, he scribbled a laundry list for his mother on a piece of local stone using a waxy ink to form the letters. It occurred to him that if that stone was bitten with acid and inked, it might be possible to obtain additional copies by applying paper to its surface. It worked, and Sonnefeller soon perfected a process to which he gave the name of lithography. His new method of producing images on paper proved easier, quicker, and cheaper than engraving or etching and within a few years, lithographic presses were being widely used in Germany, France, and England. The techniques were simple. Using a greasy crayon or ink, the artist drew his design on the surface of polished limestone. In addition to lines or hatching and stipple, the conventional methods used to achieve tonal effects, the lithographic artist could employ shading and washes to obtain continuous tones varying from light gray to rich blacks. The stone was then moistened, the water being repelled by the greasy lines of the drawing. When printing ink was applied to the stone with a roller, as you see being done over there, it adhered only to the drawn portion and not to the wet surface elsewhere. The printer then placed the stone face upwards in a movable frame on a press, laid over it a sheet of paper, and covered it with a leather mat. Adjusting a scraper bar to exert pressure on the paper and the stone, the printer then cranked the frame through the press, and that transferred the ink to the paper, which could then be carefully removed from the stone and hung to dry. The stone could then be re-inked, and the process repeated to obtain the number of impressions needed. So there's a simplified explanation of the lithographic process. And it's rather remarkable that Senefelder, within a few years of his accidental discovery, had written a treatise on this that anticipated virtually anything that would be discovered about lithography since that time. Uh, he did not quite understand that it was a, uh, a planographic process. He still thought there was a difference in the, in, the, in the surface of the stone, but anything else he anticipated. By the mid-1820s, 
the lithographic presses in Boston, New York, and Hartford, Washington, Philadelphia, a few other cities, began to supply Americans with pictures of all shapes, sizes, and subjects. Printers in other towns soon joined them in issuing portraits, sporting scenes, landscapes, cartoons, and within a few years, such city views as these, uh, New York and uh, Cincinnati. Now, I'm going to be mentioning pairs of views, and the first city that I mention is always going to be on the left, if I have the slides incorrectly. Or if we're seeing only one city, the general view is going to be on the left, and the detail will be on the right. These, pu uh, these views proved immensely popular. My conservative estimate is that at least 4,000 different city views were issued in the 19th century of American cities. Like lithography itself, however, the tradition of printed city views had its origins in Europe, beginning with woodcuts as book illustrations. Hundreds of them, like this of Rome, embellished the pages of the Nuremberg Chronicle, printed in 1493. Eighty years later, the first volume of Braun and Hogenberg's City Atlas was issued with handsome engravings of such cities as Amsterdam, uh, Paris, London, Rome, two American views, Mexico City and Cusco. In the 17th century, Matthew Marion in Germany published several volumes of town views. This is his engraving of Vienna, rather typical of his quite sophisticated style. John Speed in Britain also used views, like uh, the one of Flint in Wales, combining a plan with a perspective to decorate his maps of English and Welsh counties, which appeared in atlas form in 1611. The earliest city map to be engraved and printed in the English colonies, that of Boston in 1722, also combined a kind of perspective with a street plan. Now, the author of this map was a ship's captain, Captain John Bonner. He knew a lot more about sailing a ship, I hope, than drawing buildings from the air, and he simply depicted each structure as though it had toppled over backwards, exposing its facade to the sky. But nevertheless, you've got some idea, some pictorial idea, of the uh, city itself. Now this, let me see if I can do something about the focus on this projector, or is there someone up there who can look at that? That looks blurred to me, the left-hand image. Could you? Check the projector up there, please. That's better. OK. More realistic were such engravings. Here's an old friend that we looked at earlier today of Savannah, Georgia, depicting the city in 1734, drawn on the spot then engraved in, in uh, England from a sketch by Peter Gordon. Gordon. Uh, but far more common were views such as the one of Boston that is Paul Revere's third and last view of the city in 1774. More, a, when I say more common, I mean the, the position from which the viewer looks at the city. We are down not on the water, but neither are we hovering way up in the air. We are in an elevated uh, perspective, an elevated panorama. And it was that panorama style that artists used in the early decades of the last century for engraved views of American city. Here's an attractive aqua tint of New York, for example, one of 24 prints of similar nature prepared by John Hill in the early 1820s from paintings by William Guy Walls. And then we looked at another version of that view today, the, uh, an aqua tint view of Richmond, Virginia, uh, one of uh, about two dozen uh, prepared by William James Bennett. And those showed such cities, in addition to Richmond, as Washington, New York, Boston, Buffalo, and Detroit. Now we come to the lithographic views. And the earliest of these lithographic views followed that same style of the, the kind of panorama style. Now it's true that the artists usually tried to select an elevated location as did Henry Walton when he drew Ithaca, New York in 1836. Or Edwin Whitefield standing on the hill on Mount Royal sketching the city of Montreal. But these prints, however charming and pleasant they are, uh, do not tell us much about the basic structure of the city. 
They don't show us the street pattern. They don't show us the pattern of open spaces. They don't show us uh, other things of that sort. About 1850, perhaps a little earlier, a different style of lithographic city view began to appear. And that coincided with the immigration of a good many artists and lithographers from Europe, chiefly Germany, but some from France, during the political unrest in the late 1840s. And I believe it was these people who introduced to the American scene the high-level bird's eye technique that became so popular after the Civil War. Now, having said that, I want to add that lower level panorama views continue to be made, so we had both styles being produced. You're looking at two views of Boston by John Bachman. Bachman's first known view has a date, it's a New York view, and it has a date of 1849. And so I'm, I suspect he arrived from Germany 1848 or 1849, and he arrives with a technique already developed. And we don't know anything about Bachman, just as we don't know anything about a great many of the other artists responsible for this kind of view. Here's his 1850 view, and then in 1877, he did another view. There was an intermediate view of about 1870, I believe, that Bachman also executed in Boston. And those three views can tell you a great deal about that city. Uh, we're in a different perspective from the Whitefield and the Henry Walton views. We're up in the air and we're looking down and we can see the street pattern. And we can see, contrasting in Boston, the, uh, looking at the 1877 view, that rambling, almost medieval pattern of the north end of Boston. And now we begin to get some planned order, the uh, public garden and what will later become Commonwealth Avenue and that whole back bay development are beginning to take shape. Among the first lithograph, uh, lithographs of cities in the Mississippi Valley were those prepared by Henry Lewis in 1846 and 1847. Now, these prints provide uh, a kind of time machine by which we can return to a long forgotten America, travel upstream past such infant cities as Natchez and Vicksburg, already serving as important trading and shipping centers, attracting a variety of river craft. Someone must take these Lewis views and do an analysis of the boats. They're just marvelous, all kinds of boats that appear here. The detail on these prints, uh, like uh, that of Nauvoo, Illinois, and Dubuque, Iowa, is really quite remarkable because the originals measured only about seven by nine inches. But in that restricted space, Lewis managed to provide an incredible amount of information about the appearance of these raw new frontier communities, as well as that kind of fascinating river detail, this, this raft and uh, great log sweeps and so on. We can tune our time machine to other periods. Here is Madison, Wisconsin in 1855 drawn by a man named S.H. Donnell, the architect of the Capitol, whose dome appears on the skyline. Now, Madison was less than 20 years old. I mentioned earlier today how it was founded as a, as a speculative venture. It's 20 years old, but it's the state capital. It's the site of the new state university. Very quickly, it had passed through its frontier days, and it already surpassed uh, the older river towns to the west uh, in size and in services. City views of this sort can tell us a lot about the changing character of 19th century urban America. Herman Lunkwitz, a German artist, uh, trained, we know a little bit about Lunkwitz, trained in Dresden, uh, came to Texas in about 1850, uh, went to New Braunfels, uh, Fredericksburg, did some farming, eventually ended up teaching art in San Antonio. He sketched San Antonio in 1852 adding these border vignettes of the missions in the vicinity, recalling the town's Hispanic origins. But now look at the main view. You see pitched roofs of the houses in the foreground, and that's really recording the penetration of this much older Hispanic culture by settlers from the east and north and by Europeans like Lunkwitz as well, that altered the pace and direction of urban life in that uh, city, what had once been the principal outpost on the northern edge of New Spain. The industrial growth of 19th century America can also be documented by these views. In the 1870s, both Pittsburgh and Cleveland flourished as major manufacturing centers. And as you can see, their waterfronts had been preempted by railroads, wharves, and docks. 
and from the dozens of smokestacks called plumes of smoke that a century ago marked urban progress when air pollution was almost synonymous with prosperity. Now, artistically, I find this Otto Krebs view, uh, this elevated panorama of Pittsburgh, is superior. But the high-level bird's-eye perspective that Albert Ruger provides tells us a great deal more about the structure, the nature, the pattern of the city of Cleveland. Here are two other examples that illustrate that point. In 1850, the Smith brothers published a handsome view of Philadelphia, as drawn by J.W. Hill. We're looking from a point on the New Jersey shore, uh, looking across the Delaware River at the city. Uh, John Bachman issued a rival print five years later, showing the city as seen from the opposite direction. We're lifted now high above the site now occupied by the University of Pennsylvania. That stream in the foreground is the Schuylkill River. Now let's look at some details of Bachman's lithograph. That's a very, very helpful in examining the structure of the city. The prominent features uh, include the central square that William Penn laid out, now occupied by the city hall. That and the four other squares that uh, had been planned by Penn and the open space south of Independence Hall have been major form-giving elements throughout the city's long growth. And augmenting Philadelphia's, moving on to the, uh, the other view, augmenting Philadelphia's initial recreation space was Fairmont Park, which was an outgrowth of the landscape grounds of the waterworks, which you see toward the lower left-hand corner of the right-hand view, uh, just below the hill that later became topped by the Museum of Fine Arts. Then beyond in that view are the, the famous Philadelphia Penitentiary and Girard College, which in their quite separate ways were widely admired by visitors, if not by all of their occupants. In the quality of those fine prints uh, by Bachman, uh, when he had a rival, and his name was Edward Soxey of Baltimore, he did a number of superb views of his own city, his adopted city. He also was a German. But he also published several of Washington. Now, we're looking at his view of 1852, looking over the shoulder of the Capitol uh, to the mall, then occupied only by the Smithsonian Institution, and then up Pennsylvania Avenue to the Treasury. Um, Twenty years later, his view from almost the same point reveals the substantial growth that had taken place. Now, in both these views, Soxie anticipated something that never in fact occurred. If you look at the Washington Monument in both views, if you can just make it out, you'll see that he depicts it as though it had been built according to Robert Mills' design for that elaborate uh, colonnaded base and the, uh, the, the, the top, which was a much blunter point than actually was developed. Uh, but these are, he also anticipated a few other things. In this view on the left, the two wings, the Senate and the House wings, they had just been put under construction. They were not to be finished for some time. And in his 1871 view, I think the cast iron dome, the new dome had not quite been complete, but I'm not certain. Uh, I guess it had by that time. The Soxy firm also published a few uh, splendidly executed, executed views of cities in the Ohio Valley. Now, here we have the Indianapolis view, which he did. Uh, which was one of those views, uh, Columbus, Ohio, Wheeling, West Virginia. And yesterday I found in the, uh, in the state library the Soxie view of Madison, Indiana. And my guess is that in that 1854-1855 period when these views were done, uh, Soxie may have executed some other views of, of other cities that I have yet to discover. This is a rather uncommon one of Indianapolis. Uh, the idea of border views, of vignettes, of individual buildings had already been developed by that time. But those are the two sides, those two long views at the bottom. Those are the two sides of Washington Street. And that is a, a rather uncommon feature. It, uh, I'm not sure whether Soxie originated this, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's something a, a bit out of the ordinary. Soxie, I might say, was one of the printers in this country who experimented uh, early on with color lithography, something I'll have a word or two uh, to talk about toward the end of this talk. Good lithographers were plagiarized by others of less talent. 
Charles Magnus of New York issued this view of Annapolis in 1864. It was an almost line by line copy of a slightly earlier and far better uh, printed lithograph by Soxy. Now this was a hand colored one. Magnus never seemed to get his colors right. Those blobs of red paint on the, uh, on the uh, paddle wheels of these steamers look as though he had applied this with his elbows, and for all I know, he did. And that's true of virtually all of, this, of the, the Magnus lithographs. He did some original work. He did what apparently is the only known view of this type of Alexander of Virginia, but mainly he seemed to have specialized in uh, incompetent uh, plagiarism. Lithographic artists of the period did not ignore or neglect the South, although views of southern cities are somewhat less common than those of the North or the Midwest or, or, or the East. J.W. Hill, in 1855, produced this really superb Savannah lithograph looking north up Bull Street, the principal street, with Monterey Square in the foreground. Uh, beyond, one can see many of the other squares that had been planned in the colonial period or in that period of the 19th century that I talked about this afternoon in which the city had duplicated Oglethorpe's marvelous uh, system of, of little urban neighborhoods. Now, beautiful and superb as that lithograph is, the one by C.N. Dry, who is probably the same person as Camille in Dry of St. Louis, but I'm not certain. Uh, this one of Charleston tells us a great deal more about the structure of that city. We have to know that Savannah consists of a series of these wards. In Charleston, we can see what the basic structure of that city is from that, that, that view. It's far more revealing, uh, although in terms of artistic uh, skill, uh, the, the dry lithograph is clearly not as well executed as this farm drawing by Hill. New Orleans provided an attractive subject for urban artists. Uh, here is Hill again collaborating with one of the Smith brothers, Benjamin Franklin Smith Jr., uh, to produce this striking view of the city in 1852. We're looking down the river uh, from the Garden District to the old French Quarter, which is, we can barely see in the distance, uh, that older section of the city appears more prominently in a view of 1850 drawn by Thomas or Theodore Miller. We're not quite sure what his first name was. He signs it's T.H. period, probably Theodore, published in Europe. Uh, it's rich in details of, of river craft and of, of wharf activity. Uh, and it tells us something, although not quite high enough level to show us all that we would like to know about the basic pattern of New Orleans. So, New Orleans planned in 1718, and the, the French Quarter appears on the right-hand part of that Miller lithograph. Uh, here's another important town on the, on the Mississippi. When Lewis sketched Memphis in the 1840s, it presented a respectable facade, all right, but virtually all of the buildings were located within two or three blocks from the river. The city's most vigorous period of growth lay ahead, and Ruger's depiction of Memphis in 1870, not many years later, uh, just after its military occupation had ended, shows that bustling cotton and lumber center expanding to the east uh, beyond that sloping steamboat landing and the growing business district. If a city had not developed in fact, it could be made to seem so with the aid of lithography. In 1838, a three-dimensional scandal, Darius Holbrook commissioned William Strickland, one of our great architects, to design an ambitious plan for Cairo, Illinois, where Holbrook was speculating in land. And armed with that handsome view, he went to London and talked a lot of hard-headed London bankers out of a million dollars by representing that view as what he had accomplished rather than what he proposed. Now, Holbrook pocketed most of that money, and the Cairo shown in Lewis's view of 1846 indicates that he spent very little of it in improving the town's riverfront or anything else uh, uh, except improving his own financial position. 
When the great land boom began in Kansas and Nebraska in the mid-1850s, a few urban lithographs were used for the same kind of purpose. Some were beautifully done. This view of Sumner, Kansas, drawn by an anonymous artist and printed by the Cincinnati firm of Middleton Strowbridge and Company, which did some very, very fine lithographs. Uh, a young and proper Bostonian lured to the spot when he saw this very large, very attractive lithograph displayed in the East, referred to the print in an outraged letter to his father as a triumph of lithographic mendacity, he said. And the, the supposed city with its fine Sumner House Hotel, that handsome brick building, uh, all these brick stores and warehouses down along the Missouri River consisted, he said, only of a few log huts and miserable cabins. And there were good many others lured to Sumner uh, by that same print, I'm certain. Well, Sumner joined very shortly, within five or six years, the dozens of ghost towns whose skeletons littered the banks of the Missouri, but there were others like Lawrence and Topeka that grew and prospered. In the political battle raged in Kansas, as in virtually every other western state, Lawrence won the state university uh, Topeka emerged with the coveted designation as capital city. Actually, in the West, the, the, the order of desirability was something like this. You wanted to be the state capital. Uh, if you lost that, you hoped to get the state penitentiary. And if you couldn't get that, you hoped for the state insane, uh, insane asylum. And fourth place was the state university. And it was, it was purely and simply in terms of the payroll. Uh, the university would consist of uh, five or six persons, I suppose. Now, these newly founded communities, like Lawrence and Topeka, and many others like them in Nebraska and the Dakotas, uh, they marked for a time the edge of the frontier that had been pushed steadily outward from the settled east. But there was another frontier line that by that time was advancing eastward from the Pacific coast where the gold rush had created a new and extensive region of settlement. Views of new towns, mining camps in this area were in great demand by armchair adventurers. The earliest, like George Cooper's uh, depiction of Sacramento in 1849, were printed in the east from sketches that were rushed from the scene. Now we're looking down on the city's waterfront, There's busy wharves and stores, warehouses, hotels, and saloons. Streets here are crowded with miners uh, outfitting themselves, returning to the town to spend uh, their gold, or perhaps disappointed with their luck, preparing to return to their, uh, their homes in the east. There are a lot going on in this view, and Cooper's uh, View. There are many versions of the same view of Sacramento. Here is what is probably the earliest view of San Francisco after the gold rush. The one on the left came from the pen of a man named Henry Folks and the press of Thomas Sinclair of Philadelphia. Uh, Nathaniel Currier, not yet the firm of Currier and Ives, Ives had not yet come into the firm. Nathaniel Currier issued that rival view a year later from a drawing by William McMurtry. Now, both of these views help us to visualize this incredible episode, this overnight development of a major city, uh, that town that was so swiftly expanding over the hills of Yerba Buena Cove. And we look down at that forest of ship's masts, and those are deserted ships because the ships that sailed with the 49ers as soon as they got to San Francisco, the crews jumped ship and went tearing off of the mountains like all the rest. And for months, deserted ships sat out there in the harbor. It was an incredible episode. The other views showing the effect of the gold rush that made their appearance abroad. This is Frank Marriott's uh, quite skillful rendition of the central portion of San Francisco, published in London in 1851. Then we can see American and Chinese and Mexican figures in the foreground suggesting the uh, cosmopolitan character of this city, which had attracted residents and adventurers from all over the world. This print also, I think, uh, particularly that detail on the right, uh, illustrates the advanced technical quality of European lithography with those softly blended tones and the, the long diminishing shadows, that backlighting effect. I think that's a, that's a magnificent piece of lithographic art. As San Francisco boomed into this instant metropolis, lithographers 
set up printing establishments there to satisfy the growing local demand for uh, city views and to compete with eastern firms in the national market. The firm of Britton and Ray uh, issued George Goddard's view of the mining town of, of Columbia in 1852, shortly after thousands of miners had scrambled to the site of one of the richest gold strikes in the Sierras. Uh, dozens of other mining camps in California were recorded on stone by the firm of Kiko and Dressel in the mid-1850s. Starting about 1855, that firm issued this big series of views, uh, Angels Camp, Auburn, Coloma, Grass Valley, and this, uh, which I think is their best, this double view, this uh, really lovely thing of Scotts Bar and, uh, and French Bar, uh, record the rough and ready flavor of those communities that the gold rush had created quite literally overnight. And then we get those very valuable views, the border views, the vignettes around the edge of the, of the print, showing us a lot that we can get from no other source about the character of that mining camp architecture. The Kiko and Russell series included a view of Los Angeles in 1857. Now this town had been scarcely affected by all the turmoil of the gold rush. Uh, it still retained, as you see, much of its Spanish and Mexican character with one and two story uh, flat roofs. Most of the buildings were built of adobe. Uh, the outdoor oven, that curious object down in the lower left of the right hand view, that's an outdoor oven. A reminder both of the gentle and then smog free climate and of the rather primitive conditions that uh, still prevail in that very small community. A quite different in atmosphere from either these Hispanic towns of Southern California or this broom atmosphere of Northern California where the, the towns of Oregon with their predominantly Yankee population, and these were also recorded on stone by that enterprising firm of Kekel and Dressel, uh, Portland, Eugene, Salem, the Dollies, uh, Oregon City, there were others that that firm did. You're looking at the Portland view, and there's a detail of, of one grouping of those vignettes uh, providing the kind of architectural information of the appearance of Portland in its first decade of existence that would be hard to find in other sources. Britton and Ray printed views for other publishers, uh, such as Kekel and Dressel, but they produced many urban views of their own. Uh, I hope it's clear that their most spectacular and impressive early work was this uh, enormous lithograph by George Baker showing Sacramento in 1857. Now remember what it looked like in 1849, that view that we saw just a moment ago. And if you pair those two views, you then begin to get some kind of understanding of that hectic tempo of urban growth that in less than a decade converted Sacramento from a city of tents and shacks into a major community, which looks very much like, looked very much like any long settled eastern city. Stretching back from the river, that immense grid of streets crisscrossing where once the General Center's cattle had peacefully grazed uh, before the miners swooped in on him and dispossessed him of his land. Britton and Ray kept abreast of the continued expansion of Sacramento when they commissioned uh, an artist named Augustus Koch, K L C H. I can't find one shred of biographical information about him. Uh, he did many fine views of the West. Uh, here's the Koch view with the detail of, of the capital area. By that time, much of the waterfront had been taken over by the railroad, which was then serving uh, Sacramento. Uh, the business district had moved farther inland, and we get the new capital on a site that would turn out to be grossly inadequate for a state that would continue to grow so rapidly uh, over the years. So this is 1870. A year later, <coughs> excuse me, Burton and Ray published another Coke view showing Los Angeles five years before the arrival of the Southern Pacific Railroad. Now that event ignited a land boom of truly awesome consequences that was rekindled the next decade when the Santa Fe Railroad arrived and began a rate war with the Southern Pacific that at one time dropped the, the passenger rate for one day from Kansas City to Los Angeles to one dollar. 
Uh, it didn't prevail very long. But you could get from the east or the Midwest to Los Angeles during this rate war for ten, twenty-five dollars. Um, by the end of the century, now here we're 1871. This is on the right is Los Angeles in 1894. The city is now so big it can't be encompassed in one viewpoint. So the artist sort of splits it in two and looks one way for the upper part of the view and one way for the other. Uh, and as you can see, this, this is by a man named B.W. Pierce, and I can't tell you anything about him. But here you can see the nation's most undisciplined urban region is off and running, and it really hasn't stopped since. Another San Francisco firm, Snow and Roots, issued several views of their city to record its continued expansion. This one I like the best. I think it's the most impressive, certainly the most unusual because of its size and its orientation. We're hovering over the Pacific Ocean uh, looking east. And uh, it's drawn by a man named George Goddard, who was an English architect, went to San Francisco, uh, did that view of Columbia <clears throat> that you saw a moment ago, and then designed a, a neighborhood in San Francisco, became a major surveyor for the state, Mount Goddard in California. I think it's the second highest peak in the state is named for him. Had an unrivaled collection of California graphic material, historical material. And in 1904 began negotiations, he was an old man, began negotiations with Stanford University for the transfer of all of his material to the Stanford Library. While those negotiations were going on, the great earthquake and fire appeared, his house was demolished, and Goddard died a month or so later, I presume, of a broken heart. Well, uh, but back to happier days when he was doing this view, he knew how to handle topography and could show us the rough and rocky uh, character of that city as uh, no other depictor of San Francisco did. And in the, in the detail over there, you can pick out such details as the Cliff House or the old San Francisco Presidio uh, in the upper part of that slide toward the middle. A decade later, 1878, Currier and Ives published uh, a more conventional view of San Francisco from a drawing by Charles Atwater. We're now looking down that diagonal slash of Market Street that leads off from the bay toward Mission Dolores. It, I think, is the first view to show Golden Gate Park, which is not that, but is this. And I'm not quite sure what that is supposed to be. That may have been the location that Frederick Law Olmsted proposed for a park that he was suggesting. But there's Golden Gate Park. And it was the development of that park on these hitherto untamed uh, dune lands with the use of all kinds of, of planting materials that have been brought in from uh, Australia uh, that proved that one could stabilize that area and eventually of course the entire city or the city began to move in that direction and eventually built as far as the Pacific shore. So we've got two frontiers of settlement now. We've got one out here in California moving east. We've got one about a third of the way through Kansas, Nebraska, the Dakotas, down to Texas. Those two frontiers of settlement uh, following the Sierra foothills and the eastern Great Plains uh, took a big jump in the late 1850s, coming closer together, beginning with the stampede to Nevada in the mining region on Mount Davidson, the, the famous Comstock load, where Virginia City quickly became the dominant community. Now this view is by a quite remarkable man about which some people in California have begun to turn up some useful information. His name is Grafton Brown. He was a black artist, lithographer, and publisher in San Francisco and later in Canada. He produced the first view of this town. We're looking down those streets that are stretched along the slopes of Mount Davidson and Although this view on the left, the portion of the view on the left, does not show all the border views. It was bordered with a whole series of, of uh, little vignettes, like the one on the right, showing, among others, the office of the Territorial Enterprise, the newspaper in Virginia City. And that, of course, is where Mark Twain got his first uh, chance to write as a cub reporter for the, for, the, for the paper. By 1875, Virginia City had reached its peak of prosperity, and Augustus Koch sketched its business blocks, hotels, restaurants, saloons, gambling halls, and retail shops that line C Street. That's toward the top, just below the mansions of some of these millionaires that had built their homes farther up the hill. 
You'll see in the detail there a group of churches between E and G streets that stood as kind of symbols of morality between the upper town and the Chinese quarter and red light district that was located on the lower slopes near the mine entrances and settling ponds. There's a steep climb to the top in Virginia City, both physically and socially, and a person's location on that inclined Cartesian grid was a, served as a reliable index of his place in society. The Colorado mining rush in 1859 pushed the eastern frontier several hundred miles toward the Rockies. And that event was also documented by publishers of Urban Views, uh, one of whom was Alfred Matthews. He wasn't much of an artist, but he meticulously, rather mechanically, recorded the appearance of all the important mining centers of the region. This is his lithograph of uh, Black Hawk in 1866, typical of his work. Two years later, Matthews made his way to Montana, where there was now a new mining boom underway, and to sketch, among other scenes, another Virginia city that, like its Nevada namesake, was enjoying uh, mining prosperity. So we have the two Virginia cities, uh, Nevada and the Matthews version of Virginia City, Montana. But it was Denver, uh, where the site of gold was first discovered in the bed of Cherry Creek, that little stream coming into the South Platte River. The big strikes, of course, were made uh, along the narrow stream valleys up in the mountains. Denver became the supply and transportation center for the tens of thousands of miners that streamed across the Great Plains to this new El Dorado, and in such places as Central City, they began to carve streets and building sites out of the rugged slopes of the Rockies. Both of these views are by a man named Eli Glover and provide revealing glimpses of both of these communities when they were less than 15 years old. Glover, like Matthews, moved on in search of other subjects, and like Matthews also, served as his own publisher. On the Pacific Coast, he produced lithographs of Santa Barbara and Seattle, which you see here, in addition to those in similar in, in appearance of San Diego, Los Angeles, Santa, uh, Santa Monica, Portland, and Tacoma, and probably some I don't know about. He was a skilled craftsman. Uh, combined accuracy with attractive composition. Uh, quite often he used some foreground figures to add a, a little bit of liveliness to his views. And maybe he had a sense of humor as well. Here's his large view of Olympia, Washington. Uh, down here toward the lower left-hand corner, you see that figure uh, at an easel sketching. There's a detail of it. And my guess is that that's a self-portrait. That's Glover. And we don't really know anything else about what Glover looked like. I have found some biographical material on Glover in two sources, and it is as though they are dealing with two different men. I cannot get them to, to reconcile, but we'll find more about Glover eventually, I hope. There are a number of other artists in the West, in the East too, but mainly the West, who are known by only one or two views, and again, where very little, if any, biographical information about their background, training, or whatever, is no one. Who is the G.R. Beckler who did this really lovely lithograph of Helena, Montana in 1865? Now, he drew it, uh, and it was published in Philadelphia just one year after this town exploded into existence uh, following the discovery of gold in Last Chance Gulch. Isn't that a marvelous name? And Beckler was out there. I have an idea that he was perhaps a surveyor for one of the Transcontinental Railroad surveys. I have a dim memory of encountering his name. I cannot now find it in any source. The view is published in Philadelphia. Did its appearance stimulate Christian Inger, who was a Philadelphia lithographic craftsman and an artist, did it stimulate him to make his way west two years later to draw this view of Salt Lake City? This seems to be the first large single sheet lithographic depiction of Salt Lake, uh, showing the Mormon capital that had been planned 20 years earlier under the direction of Brigham Young. Now, these two views really should overlap to show you that it's a long, narrow view. It's very difficult to show in one slide. The tabernacle is that sort of Zeppelin hanger that you can see under construction. It's about to be finished 
the temple, which is the cathedral-like building there, with all the spires, in 1867 there was nothing there but the foundation. But Truman Angel's drawings for the temple had been published, and Inger evidently relied on that. Uh, I don't know what he relied on to depict a stagecoach about 90 feet tall out there in the prairie some 20 miles out of Salt Lake. His sense of proportion was not always uh, the best. Now, here's another view of the same city. Three years later, 1870, here's Augustus Koch, a different point of view. We're way up in the air now, and we see that Koch did the same thing. He anticipated the completion of the Mormon temple by about 30 years. Uh, a small detail, I suppose. One has to be a little careful about some of these things. Now, that view appeared uh, shortly after the nation had been linked together by the great transcontinental railroad. While Omaha was the official eastern terminus of the Union Pacific, Congress had approved five connecting lines to provide connections with the rest of the country. One of these lines was the Hannibal and St. Joe, Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad in Missouri, and the citizens of Hannibal confidently expected that this little Missouri settlement would soon be a second Chicago or St. Louis. Now, here's Albert Ruger's depiction of Hannibal. Ruger was one of the most prolific of the artists, active in this state, did several views of Indiana cities. We're looking at Hannibal as seen from the Illinois side of the Mississippi. Then here is this wonderful little detail. We've got a steam ferry that's come across from Hannibal. There are some conquered coaches waiting to take passengers off of the of the railroad train that's chuffed its way into that delightful little depot. In the river, we've got this log raft being steered by sweeps heading down toward the lumber mills of Hannibal or perhaps for some other river port downstream. Beyond is the uh, river landing where Mark Twain a few years earlier had suffered that attack of steamboat fever from which he never fully recovered. And in the town itself, Ruger drew every building with considerable detail and accuracy. Now this is an incredible accomplishment when I, uh, you, one learns that in that same year, 1869, Ruger prepared more than 60 other urban lithographs of similar size and style. How was it done? Well, I cannot tell you. I will talk to you a little bit later about how these were drawn, but how anyone could do 60, I cannot say. He must have had some helpers. Well, Hannibal didn't make it. It was Omaha, rather than the Hannibals of this country that benefited from the Union Pacific. In barely more than a decade, that town had flung that big network of streets westward over the rolling slopes, uh, almost to the horizon. The, even the loss of the state capital in Lincoln uh, hardly slowed the growth of the city. And when a man named Lombach in 1867 and Ruger, the ubiquitous Ruger in 1868, depicted Omaha, its citizens were awaiting the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad with what surely must have been greedy anticipation. And then beyond Omaha, dozens of towns were planned along the lines of the Union Pacific or the several other railroads that soon thrust their way across the plains and into the mountains. Here are a couple of whistle stops, Columbus and Harvard, Nebraska. Well, if you begin to count the structures in some of these towns, you get come to a conclusion, the population could not have been very great. It is inconceivable to me that an artist or publisher could have produced one of these views and expect to sell enough copies in the town uh, to make his cost, let alone a profit. And my certain, my conviction is, although I have <clears throat> as yet no hard evidence, is that the railroads themselves subsidized the production of these views, displayed them in eastern cities and in Europe where they had immigration bureaus in order to attract people to come out, settle on the towns that they themselves had laid out, and to begin to produce farm products that would be shipped on the lines. Producers of these views had other sources of subsidies on which they, they could rely. Uh, well, I'm anticipating, but here's another uh, imp rather more important railroad town, Cheyenne. 
a division point, that is, the railroad shops were located here. This, too, was planned by the, the, the railroad. Uh, and I'm, I'm not certain about this one, but my guess is that Columbus and Harvard views were, were subsidized by the railroad. Perhaps the publisher of this view might have made enough money selling it in Cheyenne. But there are other sources of, of revenues. <clears throat> Those vignettes that I've talked about a couple of times, such as the one on this lithograph of Reno in 1890, they depict places of business. I'm fairly certain that the owners of some of those places of businesses paid a fee for such special treatment, or they subscribed for a certain number of views, uh, guaranteed a purchase in advance. And perhaps the Bank of Nevada uh, did that in order to get its impressive building uh, immortalized on this lithograph. Industrial promotion and civic publicity probably motivated the publication of other views. We do have some sketchy records that there were some municipal subsidies for a few of these views. Cities did subscribe to a certain number of copies and probably sent them around the country for advertising purposes. I don't know if that was true of Butte in Montana, but certainly the lithograph showing the the prosperity of this uh, copper smelting town uh, might have been enhanced if these, this rather attractive lithograph had been uh, distributed. Viewmakers neglected the Southwest until the 1870s. When Herman Brosius depicted Dallas in 1872, it was the year that the Houston and Texas Central Railroad reached the city to be joined the following summer by the Texas and Pacific Line. Well, Brosius knew that the line was coming, and he obligingly drew that second railroad as if it had already been completed. Four years later, another artist, D.D. Morse, ventured a little farther west, found Fort Worth, equally primitive. Well, like Dallas, not very much more than a dusty cow town. Here is Morse's lithograph in 1876, uh, looking down on the only uh, solidly built up part of the city, a block or two of Main Street coming up from that little courthouse uh, up above on the banks of the Trinity River. When the railroad arrived in this town a year later, uh, the shrill whistle of that first Texas and Pacific locomotive signaled the beginning of a new era of growth that would change this scene beyond all recognition within a decade or so. Both Austin and San Antonio sat for their civic portraits in 1873 when Augustus Cope made his first visit to Texas. And here's that planned capital that I was trying to convince you of this afternoon as being such a great piece of planning. Uh, Austin uh, developing as Edmund Walter and President Mirabel Lamar had intended. Uh, we're looking at it about two decades into its existence. The San Antonio view, uh, San Antonio, much, much older city of Hispanic origin, and that fascinates me because look at all those plazas that have been developed as the city has expanded out in that grid section to the right and echoing the old Hispanic culture, the, the, the plaza which was the center of every Spanish town. Henry Welge, uh, a lithographer in Milwaukee who had done work for other people and by the 1880s had started his own firm, he added to the growing list of Texas towns whose aerial images became available uh, during the 1880s. He did this one of, of uh, Denison, Waco, Paris, Honey Grove, Greenville. And then a rival from the east, a man named uh, Thaddeus Fowler, found the market for Texas views too tempting and came out, uh, published a rival view of Denison from the opposite point of view. So you could, within a few years, you could really see Denison going or coming, if you want to look at it that way. And then did a number of other views of such towns as Kwana, Childress, Clarendon, and Wichita Falls. Fowler's most important lithographs, however, were those of Oklahoma. He apparently was the only lithographic artist to get to Oklahoma shortly after the Great Land Rush. And here's his depiction of Oklahoma City. There's a subtitle someplace that says, A City of Ten Months. So here's a city that overnight became a tent in shack town of 10,000 people from noon until midnight. 10,000 people arrived. And then within 10 months, there are now, there's a pipe water system in this town. There are some horse-drawn uh, trolleys. There are some electric lights. There is municipal gas. Uh, 
and the tents and shacks had given way to uh, crude board shelters had given way to houses of, of substantial quality. Viewmakers followed the, uh, the railroads, the southwestern railroads, toward the Pacific to prepare drawings of other new and raw communities and new towns that sprang up along their tracks. Here's where in 1886, uh, this is Augustus Koch again, we were in Albuquerque, where railroad officials had decided to plan an entirely new town about a mile and a half away from the historic old Spanish town that dated back from 1706. And almost overnight, within a matter of weeks, practically, the old town was practically depopulated. Everyone moved over to the new town planned by the railroad. And thank God they did because this sort of slumbered away and as at least some of the old buildings have survived and then in recent years a new generation has taken on the task of some kind of refurbishing and uh, preservation. Arizona views are very, very rare. I, I've been able to find only two. It seems strange there is not one of Tucson, but there is not. I have located only views of Prescott, which you see here, the planned territorial capital, and Phoenix, the city that ultimately wrested that prize from Prescott. Now, both of these views are done in the mid-1880s by a man named C.J. Dyer. I have found one other view that he did of a California city and one map that he's executed, and no one else, no one in Arizona can tell me anything about Dyer. This Prescott view is a, a fine example, I think, of color printing. I would not argue that that is great art, but it is, it begins to have a kind of a cigar box illustration quality to it. it uh, but even more so is Dyer's view of Phoenix. And that was printed by a, uh, both of these apparently printed in San Francisco by the Schmidt Label and Lithograph Company. That company specialized in doing, among other things, cigar box labels and cans and boxes and so on. But they did a few city views. Now look at that composition, that kind of oval shaped uh, uh, enclosure of some sort of rustic uh, branch. And then these little vignettes, these details up in the corners that tell us a lot about what Phoenix was like. Here's a town that's uh, about 10 years old, and, and uh, if that, as a matter of fact, it's quite a new city. I've found one copy of each of these in existence. There are possibly more, but I'm talking about recorded copies in institutions. They must have been popular. They must have appealed to the, those bold colors, must have appealed to a kind of unsophisticated frontier audience. Uh, but if so, the ravages of time, or perhaps merely a small addition, have taken their toll. And uh, the Phoenix view is in the Library of Congress. The Prescott view is held by a Texas museum in Fort Worth. By the last decade of the century, the popularity of the bird's eye view had begun to wane. But uh, between 1888 and 1892, the American publishing company of Milwaukee issued a series of very large and handsome views. Uh, this one of Houston is typical. A rather long, narrow view, rather bold colors, restrained titles, uh, equally impressive and rather more unusual in its color printing is that view of Colorado Springs. I, the firm was trying to get something that looked like an oil painting. Uh, the slide doesn't convey the kind of richness of the, of the printed color of that, of that view of the city that includes Pikes Peak and if the view is not cut out, yes, the Garden of the Gods, those strange rock formations that you see in the far right. Now I want to conclude by examining how these views were prepared and describing uh, some of the techniques of Ruger's view of South Bend, Indiana in 1866. He had to make dozens of ground level sketches of individual structures, determine the vertical and horizontal angles that he wished to use, construct some kind of perspective grid from a street map or from his own drawings on the ground, and then redraw every tiny building as if seen from the air. Now very few of these working sketches have survived, but among them, are those used by Edwin Whitefield. You remember I showed you his Montreal view early on. This is a little sketchbook <clears throat> that he used for his view of Quincy, Massachusetts toward the end of his life, the view that appeared in 1877. 
two pages of this little sketchbook. Now, the, the book, if you can see my hands, the book is about like that. It's like a, like a professor's grade book, and it was bound to be used vertically. He opened it up and used it horizontally. He had a little more room that way to sketch. The upper panel of this view on the left shows the John Quincy Adams homestead with that elaborate stable. Now, remember that roof, that uh, shape of the, of the roof and that detached stable. The lower panel of the right-hand view <clears throat> is the white field sketch on the ground of the Charles Francis Adams house with its detached library. And on both sketches, you can see that the artist made some pencil notes about the nature of the topography. I can't read that from here, but I recall one saying something about the, the orchards uh, begin down the hill or the ground falls off in this direction or something of that sort. To remind him, when he began, began to draw these things, to put in certain kinds of topographical details. So, that sketchbook now includes most of the town. He sketched a whole series of individual buildings on the ground, sometimes imagining them as in the upper part of that right-hand view, as if he had been up in the air, but in a number of cases showing them at ground level. He then made a rough drawing of the entire town using his individual sketches to place the buildings correctly on his perspective grid. Now, White Fields does not exist, but we can look at one of the fowler, incomplete and preliminary drawings. This is for a view of Sunset, Texas, this one on the left. And you begin to appreciate what was involved. You can see the streets, and he's decided on whatever his vanishing points are and all the rest. Quite mechanical kind of perspective in, in Fowler's case. That was then revised and carefully redrawn. And again, we have to turn to Fowler uh, to see what that final manuscript view looked like. That's the manuscript view, the manuscript drawing for his view of Honey Grove, Texas, a very rare example of how such drawings appeared. All right, now back to Quincy, more or less. The completed drawing was then put on stone. It could have been done in a couple of ways, but I won't go into that. And then a proof impression was pulled. Now, here's the proof impression before letters, before the title, of the Whitefield view of Quincy. It's a lousy view. It really was terrible. His earlier views are much better. On a photograph of a portion of that, I have put on in red, just to show you where those buildings are of the two Adams houses. There's one and there's the other. Now let's really zero in on that lithograph and see how they look on the lithograph. Now those houses are about a quarter of an inch high on the lithograph. On the pencil drawings in the pad, they are perhaps an inch and a half to two inches high. Now if you recall the pencil sketches, you will see that virtually all of the essential details of the sketch on the ground got recorded faithfully on the lithograph. Now we can, it is a big thing to jump to, to say, okay, because this was true of Whitefield, we can believe all lithographic views, and I do not say that. But we can put a great deal of credence in the accuracy of most of these views. Lithographers apparently were, or lithographers apparently were given or assumed some latitude in modifying the artist's final drawing, or if the artist himself put the drawing on stone, he might have made some changes for reasons that are not, already, not always apparent. Now, here is Fowler's view, the manuscript drawing for his view of Quanta, Texas. There's the finished lithograph. Now, the perspective has changed slightly. Chief Quanta doesn't appear in the printed version. The title itself is different. Pieces have been cropped from the left and the right and the bottom. Well, I can't explain the reasons. And, but there was this, uh, in many views, the artist drew uh, in the field, and then there was a lithographic artist in the printing shop who put that view on stone, and there may very well have been substantial changes. Now, a final word about the use of tones and colors. A common and simple technique in lithography was to use a second stone to print a single tone over the basic design and thus add sky and shadow details. Usually that tone was this sort of orange uh, 
buff, occasionally a gray green, less commonly a blue. Now, a skillful lithographer or artist <clears throat> combining that single tone of varying intensities with varying intensities of the black or with no color whatsoever, where the stone might have been scraped of all ink, and what you're seeing there is simply the, the tone of the paper, gives you an impression of a number of muted tones. In fact, this lithograph it's very skillfully done of San Jose, California, is done only from two stones, black and white and the orange buff. Uh, this required careful registration, usually with pins on the frame containing the stone and holes in the paper, so that the paper goes through the press once to print the black, let us say, and then it is registered on the stone that carries the, the buff colored ink, and it passes through the press again, adding that second color. Now, skilled artist gives you a wide range of colors, and it's fun to take views like this and look at them at very, very close hand or with a magnifying glass. And you get these wonderful little details of, of Mr. Giffords, uh, the artist of this view, his baseball game going on down here, or this train that's chuffing off to uh, uh, San Francisco or wherever. Then we can learn a good deal by doing that and looking at these details about the techniques of 19th century lithography. And there's that added pleasure of discovering these, these fine little details. An obvious elaboration of uh, the two stone technique was to use a, several stones, each ink with a different color. Uh, by overprinting one color with another, you could get an additional derivative colors. Now, let me illustrate this in a way that I've been fiddling around with. I don't do it very well, but I think I can get the point across. Let's start with an uncolored view of Colorado Springs in 1882 and simulate the buildup of colors on it by using uh, transparent acetate overlays. You can see here I've got my overlay half unrolled. Uh, now, suppose we had a second stone. Here's our black stone, and it's printed that image. Now, we've got another stone that carries the orange-brown color, and we get a proof impression of that stone. It would look like this. If we took that piece of paper and used the stone with the black ink to add the black image to it, it would come out looking something like the tone lithographs in which hundreds were, were issued uh, with the, the, the two-stone effect. My orange-brown is a little too yellow. I'm not very clever at this kind of thing, but you get the idea. Now, you could have a third stone inked with blue for the sky and the river, but also carrying blue ink in areas of trees and grass, which the artist wished to appear as green. And if that stone had been used to add blue to the previously printed sheet, where we already have black and the orange buff, the sky would appear in blue now, the overprinting of the blue and the what an orangey brown would produce green as a derivative color. And many, many lithographs were done this way. Three stones, but giving you the appearance of four colors. And then often a red ink stone would be used to depict the walls of brick buildings, such as this Coke view of Galveston in 1885. Now in this impression, you can see on the detail, the red stone was very, very badly out of registration. Look at the red here for that building parapet. It's lifted up and appears almost like a, uh, a crown or a halo. Uniformly throughout this print, the red color is displaced the same amount and in the same direction. Now, it's a sure indication that that color is printed color and not added by hand. On most lithographs printed in colors, the registration was rarely perfect, and lithographers made, made minor errors in preparing the tone stones. You saw a moment ago the entire Houston view of 1891. Here are two details from it. And you can see that clearly, that little strip along here was certainly supposed to be green. And what you have is blue showing because the yellow stone, there was not enough yellow to make that turn green. And you can find other instances 
uh, in, in these details of that same kind of, I think we can see it up here, where there is blue, and you can see the yellow kind of hanging out into Crawford Street, uh, which indicates that the registration was not correct. Well, it doesn't much matter. Many lithographs uh, were printed and colored. Some were hand colored in their entirety, or had hand coloring added uh, over or in addition to a printed color. Uh, determining whether such hand coloring uh, was done at the time of publication or in modern times is much more difficult, sometimes impossible. Far more important is the quality of the work. And an occasional uh, dribble of pigment like this out into the street where it wasn't intended to be just adds a little bit of charm to it. We know that that's hand colored because of the little blob of watercolor that's added. The basic lithograph had a single tone stone and then hand coloring put on uh, across it. Until recently, these views uh, have been almost entirely overlooked by historians of American art. Although many of their original purchasers certainly thought of them as art, used them to decorate the walls of homes and offices and hotels and whatnot. And this is evidenced by, indicated by the number found uh, with unmistakable evidence of having once been framed. These vertical stain lines, like this, we're looking at a lithograph of Marshall, Michigan, in its frame, here's another stain line, and we turn the frame over, and here is what causes it. 19th century framers back their prints with wide uh, boards, and through those gaps entered nitrous oxides that cause this acidic paper to turn brown at that point. Now, skill restoring can get rid of some of that, uh, but in some cases it is impossible to, to restore. Well, I hope that those, these comments will help you to look at urban views with new eyes, whether it's Indianapolis in 1871 or Chicago in 1882 or some other city that you know or wish to study. They can be approached and examined and enjoyed in many ways and for a variety of purposes. Uh, they've got a compelling charm that uh, has an appeal, I think, that's not limited just to confirmed antiquarians. They serve as revealing examples of American 19th century artistic tastes. They illustrate a novel form of community promotion and business advertising. And the resulting border vignettes provide valuable sources for the study of architectural history or for those of us who are interested in preservation. They also provide useful clues to the techniques of stone lithography and give us new respect for an age of craftsmen. They invite new lines of inquiry into the settlement of America and the important role cities played in the process. In their identification of leading business and industrial establishments, they also help us to understand better the shape and structure of our cities a century or so ago. Finally, while a typical view would not prove very satisfactory as a guide to the modern city it depicts, its limited utility in this respect reminds us of the inexorable process of urban growth, change, and renewal. So decoration, business, urban and architectural history, printing technology, and historical geography are thus uniquely combined in this endlessly fascinating form of American popular art. Thank you.